So when we talk about the month of Elul, this is obviously the, the month that we're gathering everything together. We're thinking about the whole year that passed. And of course, throughout the year, we try to grow. So we deal with certain things. But just like the summer is coming to an end in El usually, which represents a time that people are starting to become a little more serious about themselves and the less outgoing. So it's a, it's a time that people, bless you, it's a time that people can regroup about themselves and think about their lives. Well, there's, some, there's something very subtle over here about Elul, that it's not just about perfecting behaviors or working on certain behavior patterns. Like, if you do this, I'm not going to do that. Or do this, I'm not going to do this. Like you talk about Lashon Hara. So, okay, I'm going to decide that I'm not going to talk Lashon Hara for one hour, 10 hours, or 12 hours. What we really want to do is try to get to the, the root of what is it within our psyche that creates certain patterns of behavior that even if we do certain things and we, don't, we decide we choose not to do it, let's say, for example, uh, let's say you talk Lashon Hara. This is what you do. And then you make a decision, you make a vow, and you say, you know what, that's it, I'm not going to talk evil, negative talks, negative speech about somebody for the next week. But you know that in certain situations, they're going to come up and all of a sudden you're going to find yourself talking. There's going to be something that's more has more sway over you than your conscious self. Your conscious self makes one decision, and then sometimes you find yourself not listening to your own self. There's one part of the brain, let's say your left part of the brain tells you to do this or don't do this, but there's some type of reason you're programmed in a certain way that you're anyways going to do this. This could be through many, many years of behavior and patterns, but how do you unprogram yourself? There's uh, some Teachers of Musa call it the tunkala side, the, the dark side, not dark side the way it's understood psychologically, but the dark side is like the deeply ingrained self. That it comes up in reactive behavior, not in proactive behavior, not when you're, it's a premeditated choice that you're making, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that, because then your left part of the brain is going to make the decision. But if it's not that, it's just a reactive behavior. You find yourself doing something, you say, I can't believe I just did that ever happened? Or you find yourself doing, saying something, and you say, I can't believe I just said that. But you just did, and why? What caused yourself to say that? And now you, you, you think about this, and I can't believe I just said that to the other person, so insulting, I should never say that. And then you make a clear resolution in your head, I'm never going to do that again. It's not true, you will, hundreds of times. How do you do accidental acts of goodness? You know, accidentally you hurt people by mistake, I can't believe it, I didn't mean it something happened, how do we reprogram ourselves that we accidentally go around doing mitzvahs? Or accidentally go around being kind to people? How do we accidentally reprogram ourselves? This is a question. It's not a simple, simple thing. So when we talk about Shuvah and Elul, and we say that it's a, it's a gathering of the entire year and we're going to create ourselves. We're going to inhale the entire year. We're going to take a, 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 a true evaluation of our past of this entire year, how do we do this in a way that we actually come out healthy and truly reformed and transformed? So we'll go through some of the things that's talked about in Elo, and then we'll try to get to this idea, because we're obviously talking about a higher level of tshuva. There's a tshuva of action. If you look at the name of Hashem, Hashem's name that's represented in the month of Elo, in the first entry it says over here, Hey, hey, vav yud. So normally the formation of the letters of the yud ke is Yud, He, and the Vav, and then the He. But here we have the first He, then He, and then the Vav, and the Yud. Now the word Shuva, literally the word Shuva means Tashuv, the returning of He. What is He? There are two levels of He. It's the first page. So if the word Shuva means to return the letter He, there are two types of He. This he, which is referred to as he, as the word, as the lower he, corresponding to the world of malchut, or malchus, right? That's the world of action. And then there's the upper he, which is connected to the word of, upper he is connected with bina. Right? The upper he is connected with bina. So you have yud is corresponds to the level of chachma. He is connected with the world of bina. 
Chachma is intuition, Bina is understanding, Vav is the emotional attributes, and He is action. So the lower He is a tshuva of action. The higher He is a tshuva of Bina, a tshuva of understanding. So not only are we changing tshuvas, returning, are we transforming ourselves in the world of action? We do, we don't do. We speak, we don't speak. He is also Malchus, which is connected with speech. So I don't do it, I do do it. I used to do this, but now I stop doing it. But we transform ourselves also on the level of our mindset, on a Bina level. And that's incidentally, is the, the merit value of the word Elul is 67 as the word Bina. So the higher level of transformation is not only to transform action, but it's also to transform mindset. Now the problem with transforming mindset from the world of Bina is that we can't supplement one understanding with another understanding. It's not going to work. Let's say you have one mindset, which is, I think a certain way. So I'm going to try to unthink myself that way. It's not going to work, because it's yourself thinking. You're following? You can't trick yourself. So if this is your mind, okay, this is the mind, and you're trying to think, and you're thinking a certain way about yourself, and therefore that informs your action. So you want to do is change this, this mechanism here, to think differently. You can't tell itself to think differently, because who's telling itself? Itself. Therefore it's not changed. So it's going to find a thousand excuses how not to change. You have to change it from another place. You have to change it from something that's outside of that. What's outside of our rational mind? If the, if the left part of the brain is, is molded a certain way and thinks a certain way and you want to unmold it to think another way, you have to somehow change that mold. It can't be changed by itself. You can't unthink yourself. What you need is some other element of self it has more persuasion and more power than the left part of the brain. There are two things that have more power than the left part of the brain. We're going to talk about this. One is the right part of the brain, which is where things are deeply much, we'll call it right part of the brain, but it's really your subconscious. And another part of self, which is more powerful than the left part of the brain, is repetitive behavior, which transforms. That's behavioral therapy, which transforms the, the left part of the brain. So these are the two modes of attack, or the two modes that we're going to deal with in the month of Elul, which on one hand is going to be predominantly in the world of action, and through repetitive behavior, and also the world of imagination, which is the place of the right part of the brain. And by doing this transformation of these parts of self, then we can truly transform ourself. Can I just clarify the Yes, that's correct. Correct. Left information eventually, we're going to talk about this later. But left information eventually comes right part of the brain. Because the left part of the brain is also your ego. So you, yes, it sounds very interesting, but eventually you're going to go back to the same behavior. You're going to say, that's interesting. Now if you hear it long enough, maybe through longer periods of time, it's actually going to seep into you in a, dif in a different level. But if it's purely talking, if your rational self says, this is what I should be doing, and someone else rationally explains you should do something else, you may do it one time, but you're going to revert back to your old your old ways. There's actually hundreds of hundreds of studies. There's like a very, very famous study that was done in New York City. There was a person, there were people that were living in Brooklyn that had to travel to New York City, to Manhattan. And the way they traveled was a certain direction. Let's say they took this particular train. This particular train took them 45 minutes. And they were informed that if you take the train from, from another block, which is maybe not the way you usually walk, the train will take you a half hour, save you 15 minutes. Makes sense, right? Any rational person will say, okay, I'm going to save myself 15 minutes. So the first day, everyone took the new train, but the second day, everyone took the old train. So they asked them, why do you take the old train? So they had a lot of reasons. Oh, the train is nicer, and it's more air-conditioned, and people... It's a thousand different excuses, but it had nothing to do. The reason why you did it, or well, these people continued, because that was the pattern in your behavior. So how do you undo that? Right? How do you undo that? How do you undo this, this habit? Okay, so this is what we're doing the level of tshuva, tashuv, the level of tshuva in the world of action. And the world of tshuva, in terms of the mindset, we're changing our actions, and we also want to transform our mindset. And this is connected with staka tiya lano ki. So there is all right, so this verse, the, um, the final letters, but staka tiya lano ki is hey, hey, vav, yud. Incidentally, the Tzlakati Lanuki has the same numeric value of the word Bitshuva with Tshuva. And the first four letters, which is not the letters that the Arizal uses for the formation of Hashem's name, 
which is Vav Taf, Lam and Chaf, has a sum total of 456, which is the numeric value of the word Tamos and Av. Tamos are 453, and Av is 3, is together is 456. So the last letters, which are related to Ella, transform the first letters, which are connected to Tamos and Av. Right? Because what is the idea of the three months of the summer? So the three months of Tamos and Av is a very harsh month in the calendar. Right? That's when we, we commemorate the destructions of the temples, the Beis Amigdash, and you have the three weeks and the nine days, and that's all the times of all the morning. And then you say that Elul comes and rectifies Tammuz and Av. This is a rec- Elul will really come and do a tikkun, a rectification for everything that was done throughout the entire year. The Hebrew letter, the letter that Seyf Yitzir says is connected with the month of Elul, is the letter Yud. Now, what is Yud? We said that Yud, Hey, then Vav and Hey. So Yud is connected to which capacity of the brain? To Chachma. That's wisdom, intuition, that's more the right side of the brain. So how are we going to transform Elul, which is Bina, the lower, upper Hey of Bina, and the lower Hey of Malchus, of action? We're going to transform it through the letter Yud. Yud is going to be one aspect of transformation, using the letter Yud and what it represents. But Yud also, simply the word, the letter Yud is a point. And every letter in the Hebrew alphabet, every letter in the Aleph base, begins with the letter Yud. If you look at a letter the way it's written in Ksavashur, the way it's properly written in the Torah, every letter begins with the letter Yud. Which means it starts from the letter Yud, then it expands to an Aleph. It starts from the letter Yud and it expands to a base. It starts from the letter Yud, a small Yud. Which means that Yud is the essential quality of everything. Yud is also Chachma. So the essential quality of everything is wisdom. The essential quality of everything is also the, 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 the possibility of finding the wisdom in something. Every, thing in the, every experience and everything that happens to us, and every experience that, 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 that we experience, and anything that happens in the world, has a point of wisdom, which means a place for us to learn from it. If something is happening, what do we learn from it? That's the wisdom that we procure from something. And deeper, the wisdom that we receive from it allows us to see the goodness, the nekudas atoyev, the point of goodness within everything. Let's say you're experiencing something. Let's say you've done something. Maybe, maybe you even done, you, you created this thing. You created a certain reality, a certain action. The action was a negative action. Now you're looking back at it. And you're saying, I can't believe I did this thing. If you can find the wisdom in it, which means you can find why did I do it, that will allow you to change your ways. It will say, okay, I found this is the reason why I did this thing. This is also the goodness within it. Because if I do something negative, let's say, and I, and I created this negativity, if I can look back and use that negative action that was done in the past to guide me what I shouldn't be doing in the future, then I'm actually redeeming that past. Then azdoinus nasla kizachia. Something that was done negatively could be transformed into merit. How does something that I do negatively be transformed into merit? If I look in the past and I learn from it, I find the goodness within it, and I find the wisdom within it, which allows me to create new realities for myself in the present. Then I'm redeeming things of the past, and that's on some level everything that we, some of the important things that we have to do in the month of Elul is to look back at your past year and say, there are certain things that happened to me that were outside my forces. I didn't create them. Obviously, Hashem gave them to me to put these things in my life. Why were these things put into my life? What could I learn from them? What's the wisdom that I can find from that? And if I can find the wisdom, I can find the Nekudah Satoyev, I can find the kernel of goodness within that. And then also go inward and ask yourself the same question about your own doings. What are the things in my life that I did in the past year that maybe I regret now? What is the wisdom that I learned from them? And what is the goodness that I could learn for the future? And that's part of tshuva. Part of tshuva is not beating yourself up. Looking back in your past and saying, I can't believe I did this thing, I'm a terrible person. You don't gain anything by doing that. The only thing that you gain by doing that is if you can look at your past and say, yeah, I've done something terrible, but I'm not a terrible person. That's my nekudness, I tell you. That's my point of goodness within myself. I have always goodness. There's always a level of goodness within myself. I did something that was negative. What can I learn from it? What does that thing teach me? How could I learn from that experience and never allow it to reoccur? That's tshuva. Tshuva is not just 
regretting things of the past, but learning from the past, finding the wisdom of the past, and finding it as a guide that will help you live in the future. And if you can do that, then you're redeeming your past. That's the redemption of something that's negative, because that negative thing of the past now becomes something that's positive. You're not changing, you're changing your perspective and the energy that you're receiving from it. Normally you do something negative, that thing pulls you down, and continue. When you say aver, guerreras, aver, a negative creates another negativity, means it pulls you deeper into it. But if you say that I'm learning from this negative experience how to change, this is allowing me to do something differently, then that energy that you're receiving from it, instead of being something that's negative, is actually positive now. The action itself doesn't change, but what you're receiving from the action change. Instead of receiving negativity from it, now you're receiving something positive. That's the redemption of that particular action. Obviously, this is only talking about things that were done between you and yourself and Hashem. If you hurt somebody else, that's a whole other story. You can't say, oh, I hurt the other person, and now I learned this, and I redeemed that action. It doesn't work that way. You have to go make sure that you, uh, whatever, whatever the truth that you need from that other person is given. But we're talking about for yourself, things that were done for yourself. This is to the letter U. By finding the wisdom and the goodness within something. The letter U is also going to be connected with the world of imagination. The name of the month is El. Where does the name come from? So the Akkadian name, we once spoke about the names. We're the origin of the names of the month. Most of the names of the month are not recorded in Tanakh. And the few that are recorded in Tanakh are in the much later writings of the, of the prophets and the writings of the Ksuvim. And these were names that, were, that only appear after the exile, the, of, after the destruction of the first place of English. So after the Jews went into exile, according to one opinion in the Medrash, they adapted names that were names of the local countries that they were exiled into, and then they brought them back into Israel. So the, the, the name Elul is related to the Akkadian name, which comes from the word Ululu, which sounds very similar to the French. Maybe this is my imagination or not. Yeah? Sounds similar to the French. To Olala. That's the word El. The El comes from the word of, of shouting with joy. That's if it's Akkadian. I don't know if anyone speaks Akkadian here, so we don't have to worry about um, this. But if you do speak Akkadian, this is what it comes from. There's another way of looking at it that's not an Akkadian word. Akkadian is similar to Persian. Um, like the word Purim is an Akkadian word, not Persian word. That was, the lo that was the language of the written word in Persia at that time. The Aramaic sound, which Aramaic is a spoken language, it's the language of the Talmud, the Tsar. The word Elul is related to the word search. So when the Torah, the Torah speaks about the spies, it says, Loser Oisai, so the Targum, which is the translation of the Torah, the original translation of the Torah, into Aramaic, trans the, translates the word Loser Oisai, Alel Yasara. Alel Yasara means to search out, to inspect. Yasara is that, the, that land. So the idea of Elul is related to search. So the way we understand Elul is it has to do with cleansing, searching, finding yourself, inhale, gathering everything of the year. But it, it's interesting that originally this name is also related to joy. So when we think about the past and cleansing ourselves and bringing everything out of our past of the past year, it can be done in a very sober and somber way, or it can be done with joy. And it's a very sweet story of the Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov once came to a city in the month of El. And during the month of El, some people have a custom to say slichas throughout the entire month. So early in the morning, people get up, they say slichas, and usually when they say slichas, this is the penitent prayers that are said during the month of El. Usually when it says slichas, the person that's leading the prayer, they preferably they get a very old person that has a lot of tsars, a lot of hardships. And the Gemara even says you should do this. It says you should get him a tuple the Enloi, which is a, someone that has a lot of children that has no money. So someone that they really cry for Parnas, if Hashem said help them, they really mean it. So he really gets someone that's really downtrodden. And the person that gets up there to lead the prayers starts crying and wailing and pounding and screaming, right? And everyone screams together, Hashem, no, and they're crying. So the Baal Shem comes to this shul, this little town, and the Chazan, 
the person that's leading the prayers, instead of crying, starts dancing, starts saying a shamnu, and starts singing, and everyone else starts singing a happy, joyous tune. A shamnu, baganu, we're thieves, and we're robbers, and everyone's dancing and jumping. And the Balshamta thought this was kind of strange. So afterwards, the Balshamta came over to the chazan and said, what kind of custom is this? So he said that, uh, imagine the Tsar, the king of Russia, the ruler of Russia, or imagine today the president, or not the president, or some very important person that you really respect is coming to your house. And uh, your house is a little not so clean. Maybe the dishes weren't clean, and the, the, the floor wasn't swept, the carpet wasn't clean. And this person, this very important person, is coming to your house. So you can do this two ways. You can clean the house and say, Asham no Baganu, and start crying. I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning. Or you say, wait a second, what am I cleaning for? I'm cleaning so the king can come. I'm cleaning so my beloved can come. So it's done with joy. You're cleaning house. Yeah, you had this thing and that thing and the other thing that went through this year. You're collecting it. You're looking at, oh, I can't believe I did this thing. Okay, but now I want to change. Why do I want to change? Because I want to get closer to Hashem. I'm full of joy. So you can say, Asham no, if you take the word Elul to mean both search, and both shouting of joy, El can be a joyous experience of cleansing yourself, of searching and soul excavating. That's why also in El we say, El is a time, it's Yimei Ratzin, it's the time of divine mercy, that the 13 attributes of mercy are revealed in the 40 days from the beginning of El till, till, the, till um, Yom Kippur. Why is that? Because that's Yemei Ratzin, that's the time that Hashem forgave Jewish people in the story of the, of, the, of the golden calf. So the final 40 days, the last time Moshe Rabbeinu went up, he received the Luchas on, the, on Yom Kippur. So that's Yemei Ratzin, that's the time of desire. And that's why it's revealed, in this time it's revealed the 13 attributes of mercy. It's also related to Elul being the month that precedes the creation. Because just like in a creation, any type of creation, and I don't want to get graphic, but any type of physical creation or physical perpetuation of species, in order for there to be a creation, there first has to be a desire, and then there's the actual action that creates new life. So if Rosh Hashanah represents Hayom Har Asylum, right? And Rosh Hashanah, we continue to say, today is the Har Asylum. What is Har Asylum? You're familiar with this prayer? And Rosh Hashanah, you say, Hayom Har, people sing Hayom Har Asylum, Hayom Har Asylum, right? People sing the song. What does it mean? Hara song comes from the word heroin, which is the word pregnant. So the Rizal says that Russia and the world is pregnant, and the birth of the world will become a Nisan. But what happens before pregnancy? There has to be a cheshek. There has to be a desire from one towards another. So Elul is the time of desire, that Hashem desires us, desires the creation. And then finally, Rosh Hashanah is the creation. So during Elul is a very heightened time of divine desire for us. That's the May. That's why it's called Yimei Ratz in the time of desire. And that's the, 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 the 13 attributes of mercy. Yigim and Lizarachim are revealed in the month of Elul. That's why the month of Elul, in Mispar Katan, in small numeric value, which is that you take the words Aleph as one and Lamed as three, Vav as six, Lamed as three, with the three letters, with the four letters, you have 13. Elul is also related, we spoke before, with, the, with numerically with the word Bina. And Elul, as I'm sure everyone's familiar with, is connected with Ani Ludoi Di Vidoi Di Li. I am my beloved, and my beloved is myself. So the Rosh Tevis of these words, the first, the acronym, the first letter of this passage, spell the word Elul. And the final letters of Ani Ludoi Di Vidoi Di Li, what's the final letters of Ani Ludoi Di Vidoi Di Li? Ani is Yud, Vidoi Di Yud, right? They're all four Yuds. Those correspond to the 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul to Yom Kippur, which is Yimei Ratzon. Ani Ludoi Divdoi Dili is that we are to our beloved. This is very different. This is the month of Tishrei, which is the movement, or the month of Elul, which is the movement us towards Hashem. We're gathering ourselves up, and we're moving towards, towards our beloved. And then Nisan is a time my beloved is to me, and I am to him. Doi Dili Vani Loi. That's a time when there's a Sarusan Layla revealing from above. So Nisan, here, uh, Tishrei is a time from a Sarusan Latat, an awakening from below. We're moving in Elo towards Hashem, and then in Nisan it's a revelation from above. That's why in the 40 days, the laws of mikvah, a mikvah ritual bath has to have 
40 sa. So, sa is a, is a measurement, an Aramaic measurement. 40 sa is 960 lugim. 960 lugim, that's the measurements. You have 960 and 40. So we have 40 days correspond. The 40 sa corresponds to the 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul till the 10th of Tishrei. The 960 lugim the, the, is corresponds to 40 times 24 is 960, which is the 24 hours of from Rosh Chodesh El till, till Yom Kippur is the 960 lugim of a mikvah. That's why Yom Kippur we say mikvah Yisrael Hashem, that the mikvah Yisrael Hashem, that Hashem is our mikvah. Hashem, Hashem is the place we immerse ourselves. That we immerse in the mikvah of Hashem, the ritual bath of Hashem. This is a time of El. I don't want to go through all these um, acronyms that are related to El, but some of them are very familiar, which is Anil Daid Nilis Tfila. Eslavachlev Eslavav is Tshuva. Right? Isolei, Isolei, what Tadis Lavyonim is Tzaka. So you have Tfila, Tshuva, Tzaka. Inol Yadi Vesamti Lach has to do with cities of refuge, which is Tyra. Echelai Lavech Lechatas has to do with offerings, so it's connected with Mseris Nefesh. And by Az Yashir, it says, Es Ashira, Az Yashir, Az Yashir, Az so you have Elul, or letters backwards, or letters forward, which is joy. So these are different, so it's Tfila, Tshuva, Tzaka, Tyra, Mseris Nefesh, and Simcha, the five levels corresponding to the five levels of Tshuva, which the letter Tshuva itself has five words. Right, you're familiar with Ayam Yom that says Chuva, five days of Chuva, right? The first Tamim Tia, Shivisi Hashem, after Rachamach, that corresponds to the five thirds. Okay. But now we're going to get to the next, the main the, the point of here. So if you look at the, the sense that's connected with the month of El, the sense that's connected with the month of El is action. Asiya. What's that? Yeah, this page, after Simcha, the second, the third, whatever its page is called. When you fold it in half, it's the first page of there. So the month of El is connected with action. Tammuz is Ria, Avishmiya, if you were in the past, we spoke about this, Tammuz is connected with sight. Av is connected with see, hearing. So the word Ria and Shmiya spells the word Rush, which means poor. And if you take the word for Asiya, which is action, then you have Resh, Shin, Ayin, then you have the word Shar, which is gate. So Elul is the gate that allows for a new door to open for the year. It's also related, according to the Arizal, which we did, remember we did Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud, if you spell them out in full, you have 12 letters. So Dalad, Lamed is, Dalad is Tamas, Lamed is Av, so it's Dal, which means poor. Same thing like the word Rush. It represents poor. And if you take the letter um, and uh, is, a, is a letter tough, so it spells the word Dalit, Delas, which is Dord. Is anybody of Shar? What's that? This is the very result. Okay, this is a whiteboard. It's not so important. Basically, if you write Aleph, Dalit, Nun, Yud, yeah, it's four letters, but if you write it out, so you have Aleph, is Aleph, Lamed, Pei. So that's Nisan Ir Sivan. You got it? Then Dalid. Is Dalid Lama Taf? Right? So we'll reach a month of that. Tamuz of El. You following? Yeah. Aleph, Dalid, Nun, Yud. These are four letters. That's correct. The first, Aleph, Dalid, Nun, Yud, if you spell them out, have 12 letters. Aleph would be Nisan. Right? Lama is Ir. Pei is Sivan. Now that you have the next letter, Dalid. Dalit is Talmud, Lamed is of. Those letters itself spell the word Dal, which is poor. You add the Tuf, which is going to be for Elul, you have the word Delas. The same word that you did with, with Rush and Shar. Rush is also poor. Shmia is hearing with the letter Shin. Ria is to see with the letter Resh. If you take the Shin and the Resh, you have the word Rush, which is poor. Ayin is Asiya. So if you put the word I into rush, you have shar, which is gate. So Elul is a gate, is a delus, is a door, because that is the opening of everything that's blocked in the past year. Okay. The sign of the month is, is Virgo. 
Okay. So let's talk about this um, at the bottom of the page, which is life is a tension between the world of image, between the word and the image, between the right hemisphere of the brain, the left, the subconscious, and the conscious. How do we circumvent our left logical part of the brain and get deeper? Right? That was the question that we asked in the beginning is, okay, we can change this and change that and not do this. So there are two ways how this can be done. Elul is connected with the world, the world of action. The way things become deeply set into our subconscious, into deeper parts of ourselves, into our deeper psyche, the way things become deeply set into ourselves is by repetition of behavior. If you do certain things, even if it's mindless, over and over and over again, eventually your natural reaction is to do the same way that you've done. So comes Chodesh Elul and says like this, if you have a problem with your actions, if I'm gonna say, okay, I'm not gonna do it, I am gonna do it, you're just gonna function on the world of action itself. If you really wanna change yourself and change your way of thinking, therefore change your deeper part of self, not only your way of thinking, the way that gives rise to your reactive behavior, take on new patterns of behavior. And even if, they get, there's a, there's, even if it's going to appear to be silly or mindless, but these mindless actions, over and over again, that will become your second nature. Hergel Nasa Tevasheni. Habit becomes nature. So if this is your nature for many years, continuously do the opposite of that nature, and slowly you'll unwork your nature to react mindlessly doing other ways. This is one way. So that's why Elul is connected with the lower hay, which is the place of action. Another way to do this is to try to take control over your imagination. This is a, this is a much more complicated thing. It says in Chesedish Farm that up until the destruction of the second base of English was the world of action. From the destruction of the second base of English up until this present moment is the world of speech. And now it's the world of imagination. So what does this mean? In other words, let's say in the times of the bias, the times of the base of English, the times of the temple, you did something and you want to change and you want to do tshuva, what would you do? You would actually literally bring a carbon, an offering. You would take a physical thing and bring it as an offering. The base of English was destroyed that prayer became in the place of an offering. So if you did something wrong and you want to do it, you pray. You, will, you use the word, you use words. The future will come about through imagination. You're stuck, you have to imagine a new reality. There's a big struggle between Nachash and Mashiach. Nachash and Mashiach have the same numeric value. So if you look at the beginning of the Torah, it's, the story is that in the Garden of Eden and they eat from the tree of knowledge. And this is caused by the Nachash, the snake. The word Nachash, in the Torah we find also that the word Nachash means something else. Where do we find the word Nachash in the Torah besides with regards to snakes? What's that? Nechoshes? Okay, that's, that's correct. But it's nachash nechoshes. That's a, that's a copper snake. That's correct. Sorcery, the word for snake, lo yin nachash be Yisrael, shouldn't be a sorcerer in Israel, says nachash, shouldn't be a snake in Israel. So nachash has to do with sorcery. So the way it's understood is as follows. That there's the world of fantasy and the world of imagination. They appear to be the same thing. We're going to get a little bit more complicated, then we'll try to unpack this idea. It says in Gemara that a person that doesn't bow down, by moidim, their spine will turn into a nachash. It says in Gemara, a person doesn't bow moidim, their spine, which is a line, will turn into a snake. That's one Gemara. Another Gemara tells us that when a person bows down for moidim, they have to drop their head and they have to rise like a snake. 
This is the proper way of rising when you say Maidim. You bow your head down and you move your head up like a snake. This is the way it says in Shulchan Aruch, snakes rise. You pick your head up and then you rise up. So there's something about the spine and about the snake, about sorcery. What is this all about? What this means is as follows. to the finest this um, this crowd here we we'll try to make this the most best possible way that snake energy what is snake energy snake energy represents fantasy and s- snake energy in the story of the Torah the way the Torah describes it is that the Nachash the snake was jealous of Adam Right, that's what Rashi says. Rashi says that the snakes saw Adam and Chava together and desired to be with Chava. So Rashi says the name of the Medrash. No. Snake energy is fantasy. And particular fantasy with regards to such issues. There are two ways how energy can move. It can either move from top bottom or from bottom up. That's the difference between fantasy and imagination. If I'm a little cryptic, you'll have to unpack these ideas yourself. Snake energy, which comes, which rises from the mid part of the body upwards, is negative. Energy that goes from the head downward is positive. When it speaks about moidim, when a person bows a moidim, what they're doing, if you bow correctly, you're bowing your body, your head to your mid part of your body, which means that you're drawing down. Moidim means humility. I'm humble. I'm acknowledging. I'm acknowledging that there's something greater than me. Hashem, you're greater than me. I'm bowing down, bringing down from my head, lowering it down to the mid part of my body. That means that I am in control of that element of my body. And the imagination that I use, which is a lot of stuff that just come up, I'm in control of that imagination. The opposite direction, and that's why it's the world of fantasy. Fantasy is not real. It's tempting and it's, it, it appears to be something, that's why we call it sorcery also. It appears to be a truth, but it's not. It rises from the mid part of the body and then affects the way your mind thinks. So who's in control of fantasy? Fantasy is when you lose control. So therefore, if you don't bow down to Moedim, your spine turns into a snake. Meaning, if you're not in control of your fantasy, meaning it's controlling you and there's no submission, then you become it. It's cause and effect. The opposite, if you bow down to Moedim, then you're bringing down from your mind, from your intellect, into the lower parts of your body. When you rise up, you should rise like a snake because then you can elevate this type of energy. Because it was once it was there was submission from the mind to the lower part of the body, then you can bring up the energy from the lower part of the body upward. So what we're, so what this means is that if we take our deep subconscious and say, what is going on in our deep subconscious? You know what? A lot of schmutz, a lot of garbage. Talking about the Rebbe Rashab. Rebbe Rashab visited Freud, and when he came back from when he finished with Freud, the Friedrich Rebbe asked him, "What did you think about Freud?" So he said, He looked for dirt and he found it, because there's a lot of dirt. On one level, there's a lot of dirt. Where does this dirt come from in the subconscious? A lot of different things. A lot of things are beyond our control. You're born, you're raised, you have parents, you have father, mother, there's things that are going on. If we don't take control over our life and we don't at one point say, okay, I want to practice maidim, I want to bring from here, there, not the other way around, then you live in the world of fantasy and false imagination. And your, your life is dictated not by choices that you make, but that your subconscious makes. And this can come from a lot of stimuli. You see certain images, 
You're not even conscious what these images are. It lodges into your subconscious and eventually you act on it. You hear certain stimuli. You send certain stimuli. It lodges into your subconscious and eventually you react from it. This is all when you're enslaved and completely dependent on the outside affecting you how you're feeling on the inside. That's fantasy. Fantasy is other people's narrative. Imagination is your narrative. Imagination is when you create what is going on in my subconscious. How do we create what is going on in our subconscious? We can't do it through information. Because the subconscious is not created through information. It's created through stimuli, through the senses. The way to create a positive subconscious is to use creative visualizations. And this could be two points. One level of healing your subconscious is to simply supplement negative narratives with positive narratives. That's it. it doesn't even, it's not even important what the narrative is. It could even be shtusim. It could even be silliness. But if you close your eyes and automatically some images come up, if you can create those images, even if it's just silly images of yourself sitting somewhere, and it's not traumatizing images or negative images or things that are coming up from, from a very deep place, that's one level of healing. The deeper level of healing is actually you can create these images. by When you close your eyes, I don't mean this literally, but also figuratively, when you close your eyes, the images that come up are images that you created. Imagine yourself in your perfection. Imagine yourself in your perfect self. So if you can, if you can create those images of self, then that will inform your conscious self, which is the left part of the brain, and the imagery will, because it's premeditated imagery, you're creating those imagery, that will reprogram the left part of your brain, reprogram the way you think about yourself, and therefore that will reprogram yourself in terms of how you're going to act. So again, there are basically two paths. Two paths to the subconscious. One path to the subconscious is using repetitive behavior. That's why L is connected with action, with the lower hay. Repetitive behavior. You're not doing something, continuously do it. Over and over and over again, even if it's the spineless. Continue to do it, because eventually it will enter into your penetrate, deeply into your subconscious, and you'll act accordingly. Another way is, if you want to change a certain behavior about yourself, let's say you have a certain negative image. I, you know, I, I, I'm a liar. And usually I find myself lying. So this is, this is your story that maybe you've been told since you're a kid, and therefore you believe that. And therefore your natural reaction is that you're a liar, that you lie. Imagine yourself as the, the embodiment of the person of truth, at least for 15 minutes a day. Create this image for yourself in your imagination, but an elaborate imagination. Really use your imagery. Imagine yourself sitting and someone coming, and you're saying, create that. And when it, you're going to, over time, create this imagery of yourself, besides healing yourself in the negative, you're actually also going to allow yourself to reprogram yourself for the positive. And that's what the month of Elul is about. This is the hard work of Elul. And it's not just about action, not action, this thing or not the other thing, but it's about really reprogramming ourselves. It's taking everything that we've done this past year and say, okay, this is who I am, this is the person I want to become. How do I become this person? I can't just have a shi'if, a desire to become that person. I want to imagine myself already as that person. And if I can imagine myself already as that person that I want to become, in the next year you will actually become that person. So through the power of imagination, which is premeditated imagination, which is not fantasy, it's not rising down, from the below upward, but it's coming from the mind downward, you can reprogram yourself and you can all become tzaddikim and you'll have a wonderful year and uh, a lot of brachas. <laughs>